Thank you very much, Danny, for that uh, introduction. I hope I can hope to live up to it. Uh, so I'm Tom, and I'm the author of a deck of cards called Innovation Tactics, of which more later. And I'm going to talk today about sneaking agility back into Agile. And basically, I'm going to share three little methods that slip innovation in under the radar. So I've got quite a lot to get through, so I'm going to zip straight through. I'm going to talk a little bit about what goes wrong in Agile. We're not going to spend too long on that, but just a little story. And then I'm going to talk about how research might come to the rescue and how I got that really wrong in several ways. Then I'm going to share three little methods which you can use on Monday morning. And, and these are all a little bit like Kate was talking about. These are small methods that you can start using right away, but that can have really big impacts over the long term. And I'm going to talk about how they all help you to act and adapt, which is the secret to innovation. So first, the default on many initiatives and in many projects in many businesses and many startups, if we build it, they will come. I'm sure we've all felt that at times. And we have a picture that looks something like this. We've got a, an idea and a plan, and then we're going to build it, we're going to launch it, and we're going to win. And it's wonderful. At the start of the project, everyone's feeling good, everyone's confident. And we start. And we start working in Agile in sprints, and we do a bunch of little sprints. And we're building towards it, and it's all looking good at the beginning. And then as we get nearer to launch, suddenly there's a delay. We realize, oh, actually bits were more complicated than we thought. Or this MVP we were working on, it's not quite as good as we thought, and we're a bit worried that it's not good enough, and we need to cram in some more features. Or other things happen, like stuff goes wrong. People get pulled off the project, so there's a delay. Because there's a delay, well, then uh, the team has to change as well. More people get added, or people get taken off because they were expecting to do something else by now, and we can't have them anymore. And so there's more of a delay. And eventually, whew, we managed to launch. Fantastic, we've done it. Only we don't know whether it worked or not in many cases. Does that, quick show of hands, does that sound familiar to anyone? Uh, quite a lot of hands, yeah. So, this is the really bad news. When we work that way, most of those projects end up in the bottom there, and only a handful end up at the top. I think the, the statistics I've seen range from between 80 to 95% of new product, new feature ideas fail in the market. Those aren't great odds. Of course, enter research. Research and experimentation can save us. It can help us to make good products that work in the market, right? I believe this, and I worked for much of my career working as a researcher and a designer hand in hand and as a founder, and I used these two skills, research and design, to shape what I was doing and, and make better experiences. And in about 2016, 2017, I joined a startup and built the research function out there, started to train people up, uh, grew a practice where we'd bring real users in every couple of weeks, test things with them, interview them, learn about their lives, and be able to shape our products really well. Built some really cool stuff there. And I thought, this is it, we're getting there. There was a project there, and I thought, brilliant. This time it's going to be different. Because uh, the, the execs had had this idea, and it was for a, a product that would enable people to, to do something with their car loan, like a car loans type product, finance thing. And they had this brilliant idea. They saw this, this need that they were sure was in the market, got the plan going, set the team to it. And the team started, and being a good research-led team, they sent their researcher off to go and see, let's, let's get some customers in, and we'll test that the flow works really well, that people can get through it, it's really easy to use, all of that good stuff. Only the researcher came back and said, I actually can't find anyone who's a customer for this. Nobody wants it. I've looked everywhere. No one wants this. Are you sure we should keep building this? There's some other stuff they want. We could do that. Of course the team listened to the, the evidence. No. No. <laughs> Carried on. It, it, went, it was supposed to be done in three months. It was a quick project. But the same things happened. And after six months, they launched. In the following three... Big champagne and celebrations. In the following three months, one person applied and they got rejected. At the end of the three months, they shuttered the project, said, oh, what a shame, if only we could have known earlier. <laughs> this happens, does this sound familiar to anyone? Yes. A few hands now. When I shared this story a few years ago, someone from that company was there, and they said, only six months? I was one of these which went for two years. So it's, it's pretty common. I got my reckoning at that organization as well, because an anonymous product manager said this. 
The trouble with research is that it tells us either that we're building the wrong thing or that we're building the thing wrong. And I thought, that's the trouble with research? You like setting fire to money? <laughs> but the thing is, I was wrong. And I was wrong in three ways. So the first thing was, I really thought that success was about the right thing done right. Of course, we want the right product, and it needs to be done right. No, actually, every successful thing, when you look out there, is imperfect, even bad in lots of ways. It only needs to be good in a few ways, a handful of ways, certainly at the beginning, when you're doing innovation, something new. And so instead of trying to get that perfect future and, and always see the gaps between how our product is rubbish compared to what it ought to be in the perfect world, we can act and adapt from where we are right now until just enough things are just not wrong enough. You don't need to be perfect. The next thing I was wrong about, I was convinced. We can teach everyone to be evidence-based. I was training researchers, I was doing talks, I was showing how it works, I was running experiments and teaching people about statistics. No, evidence doesn't change minds. Several of the people today, the other talkers today, have spoken about this. At least not on its own. Evidence is really poor at changing minds. There are so many things going on. In fact, and one of the things that's going on, if you think back to that car loans project that I talked about where the evidence didn't work, the team couldn't change their mind because the executive who'd greenlit the project had already invested several months of energy, time, and political capital just to get that project off the chopping block. So at that point, there's already been a ton of investment. For them to come and say after two weeks, do you know what, now we're gonna can this, that turns all of that investment immediately into waste. You're flushing all that work down the toilet. Nobody's very good at doing that. So instead, we have to adapt to how humans really make decisions. There's some more about that coming later. Finally, I thought that I must evangelize the proper process. Process, well, I think this is another theme of today, isn't it? Process, all process, no. If you build a hill to die on, Danny prefigured this, you'll probably die on it. And there I was in that company, standing on the hill with my flag, dying. And the rest of the company just marched around me and got on with what we wanted to do anyway. The evidence did nothing. In fact, I, I even ran an experiment, I led an experiment with a small team that made the company millions and showed the experimentation program is really effective. I was rewarded by them shutting down the experimentation program. It was wonderful, wonderful times. I learned a lot. These things I was wrong about. So. Don't start with what you want to do, adapt to what people want to do. We've got to work from where people are and make small changes. This sounds very much like Kate's talk, I think. And so I'm gonna share you three methods that I found that sneak agility back into Agile that actually do work. And these are methods that I've created, they're coming up now. Let's look at the first one. The first one is the time machine. They've all got fun names. So the time machine is all about where should we start and it's kind of prioritization. We want to start in the right place so that we have the time and energy to adapt later if we need to. I'm gonna start with a, a slightly silly example, but it will relate to work later, I promise. So silly example, let's say that I'm trying to plan a family Christmas with my extended family. We're gonna spend the Christmas holidays together and we wanna make sure it's successful. Very good. Now, because I'm a bit of a weirdo, I've got all my family in Miro over a Zoom call, of course, because that's how we negotiate with our families. And I'm saying, right, okay, let's imagine we've jumped in the DeLorean or a time machine of your choice, and we've traveled forward in time to a little bit after Christmas. It's, it's Jan middle of January, and we're looking back at this Christmas. Uh, the, the doors open, the, the mist clears, and we look back and we go, oh, that was the best Christmas we've ever had. That's better than we ever hoped it would be. And I get everyone to write down what made that Christmas so amazing on their little post-its. Everyone has their own set and they write them down. So we write a bunch of things down and I sneak a bunch of green things in to write. Then I cluster all the post-its together and then I ask people to find ones that go together. This is affinity mapping, designers, we know this. And we start to cluster the things that go together above and make these little green stack columns. And we give each one a theme, like a name. What's this, what's this theme really about? And what we've got now, are people's secret hopes that they had for Christmas, which they might not have been able to tell us up front, but by doing that, looking back from the future, we've found their secret hopes. 
somebody's really excited about the food, someone else about movies, someone else about their cats. Some people, some, some of these things are ones that we all share, some of them are just one person on, on the, the team in the family. But we don't stop there. We get back in the time machine, but something goes wrong. We don't come back to the present day. Instead, we get flipped into an alternate universe. And now when the mist clears, we realize that that Christmas went worse. It's awful, the worst. We wish we'd never even heard of Christmas. It was terrible what went wrong. Why was it so bad? And again, everybody writes down, what was so bad about this? Same deal, we write down the things. I make some little orange stickies. And now we're gonna make clusters underneath the orange stickies. And so we start to find a bunch of hidden fears. These are things which people were concerned about, but without this time machine trick, they weren't necessarily able to share it openly with the family that they think someone else is an idiot, all this sort of stuff. But by making it that we've already had a bad Christmas and this is why it went wrong, it's safe to share it and people come up with more ideas. What we then do is we pair these up. So some of these pair up nicely, and you see that the, the, they stick together and we've got these kind of parallel universes going on. Others, we need to fill those in because the absence of something bad is good and the lack of something good is bad. So it all, it all makes sense. And we end up with a bunch of possible parallel universes. Danny pointed out this is just like the scene in Back to the Future 2 where Doc is talking about these parallel 1985s. If you haven't seen it, you're completely lost. That's okay. But what we care about is knowing how do we know when we're, when we're traveling through time normally, which of those potential future universes we're heading to? Is it the one where the McFly family are all happy and successful, or is it the one where Biff's in charge? We need to know when it's like 1956, so we can change course if, if that's the case. So the final thing we're gonna do is take a vote. Which of these parallel universe pairs is the most scary to us? Which one of these feels like it's, it's, it's quite likely, and if it happens, it's gonna be really bad. And so we take a vote. And often you get these very clear votes and, and the answers came out. In this case, it's all about the party. People are scared of the party. Now, these are very, very similar to the sorts of... This is from a real exercise that I ran to, to teach people this exercise. Um, I got people to, to facilitate a Christmas planning session. Real answers here. But they're exactly the same as what comes out when you run this with product teams. We're worried about quality. On the left, will the food be good enough? Can we do the thing right? Can we make it good enough? We're worried about desirability. Do people want to come to our party? Do they want to download our app? Will they use our feature? And we're worried about viability. Can we do this with the resources we have? Or will, are we going to get taken off the project again? Are we going to run out of money? These are all things that are very real concerns. We can then start to tackle them in the sequence that we've, we've shown is the, the highest priority, the biggest fear first. So for instance, we might send invitations out and ask people to RSVP. Do people say yes early on? We might prototype by making some of the cooking this weekend and figure out if it's any good. And we can start to discuss the trade-offs. Do we want to put our resources into buying really nice food or into buying really great decorations or great presents? What's going to be best for the group as a whole? This is very similar to what we see on product teams all the time and very similar to what I see not getting discussed on product teams all the time. We just assume that everyone wants the same things. So, with a time machine, we're getting at those hidden hopes and fears so that we can expose them and work to them. We're agreeing where we most need to be adaptive. Where do we start first so that if we're not okay, if our fears come true, we can act quickly. Whereas if our fears don't come true and we find out actually we don't need to be afraid of that, we can move on with confidence. We don't have to keep worrying about it. It's a nice place to be. So when you do this is when you're prioritizing work or debating about a big initiative. How are we gonna do this? Where do we start? And you can slip it in. This is the sneaking it in part. You sneak it in by calling it a pre-mortem. This is my twist on a pre-mortem and that's in Harvard Business Review. So people love it. It only takes 30 to 40 minutes and it helps us predict and manage risk. All business people love predicting and managing things. They don't like innovation and experimentation. So we're gonna slip this in. And when I've done this, I've seen this is one of the only methods that opens people's, opens the little door in people's heads, say maybe we do need to do some research. Often they've never even allowed themselves to consider that it might go wrong. And now they have, they feel the fear. So that's time machine. Method two can come straight out of this, it's pivot triggers. This is more about when should we adapt. It's difficult to know when it's time 
to make a change. Let's use the example of the Christmas invitation. So in this case, we're asking a question, well, how many RSVPs will be just enough for us to feel confident to go ahead with our party? What do we think? Do we need five, 10, 20? How many people will be enough to make the party right? We're starting to discuss not what the best party would be, but what the just enough, just good enough party would be. In this case, let's say minimum 10 people say yes out of 50 invites. Well, that's great. We're writing a pivot trigger statement. So on November the 15th, we will change our plans if fewer than 10 guests have replied yes when we send 50 invitations and ask for RSVPs. Nice and simple. We can share that with the whole family and all the people involved in the party and they can say, oh, I don't know if 10 is enough. Don't we need 12 or 15 or, oh, no, it's fine. We'll run the party with only three people turn up. It's fine. You can have that conversation now about what is just enough to make us go forwards. Similarly, we can do like technical pivot triggers. So here on Sunday, we'll pivot if we score the meal less than six out of 10 when we make a trial run roast dinner. It might not be the full turkey or the goose, but we can have a go. And if we burn the potatoes, maybe we decide to get a caterer, something like that. We're asking what signals do we need to see today to feel confident that it's worth investing more tomorrow? And we can always do a small version of the big thing that we're doing in order to go and get those signals quickly. So they're all of this form, basically. On date in the future, we will pivot if we see not enough signal when we probe a small, rough version of the big idea. What's magical with this is you can share this with your stakeholders, with your team, and it makes everyone aware that the plan is not fixed in stone. We are able to adapt if certain conditions show up. So, and, and this actually has changed the direction in several places. A couple of examples. This one, at the end of this week, we'll pivot if fewer than six out of 10 customers say yes when we offer them free Calendly integration to help them schedule calls. This was a team who thought this was an absolute no-brainer. Of course people would want Calendly. Guess how many did? Zero. Zero customers, which saved the team two months of faffing around with integrations. Brilliant win. We could then go and do something that was actually useful. Another example. In two weeks, we'll pivot if we see fewer than eight out of 32 customers opening the rough version of the dashboard we sent to them. We did this in Google Sheets, made by hand, just really rough and ready, and we sent it out. And what happened was about 20 came back, opened it, and several of them asked if we could send a copy to their colleagues as well. So this was a massively successful pivot trigger that said, right, we need to do this. Let's put more resources on it and make this work. So it goes, it goes, it's not always about killing the bad ideas. Sometimes it's about giving us confidence when we've got a good idea. What we're looking for is the future conditions that will make us want to adapt. And we're setting that before we start so we don't have that problem when we come with the evidence on the day and people don't want to change their mind then. It's too late. They've already invested and they've invested because they want a thing in the end. They're not investing to get the results that we're talking about. And with pivot triggers, we're just agreeing when to adapt. So when to use this, you can use this anytime you're talking about measuring success, but you can kind of use it anytime you just want to start a conversation about, well, maybe this isn't working. And the way you do that is by saying, well, obviously it's going to work. Obviously in the next month, we're going to turn this disaster around. But what if we don't? What in the weird situation where it doesn't work, what might we see in the future that would make us want to change our plan? And you can have this conversation with the Headstrong founder, with the Headstrong stakeholder, and start to set a future date, a future pivot trigger, where they've decided what signals will change their mind. It doesn't always work, but it works a lot better than evidence on its own. Third, anatomy of an insight. Now, this is, I think this is another one that Danny was getting at, at, how do we explore the bigger idea space? So this one is about how shall we adapt? So let's say we've decided now we need to adapt. The, the party's not looking good, what are we gonna do? For example, we get the RSVPs and the news is bad. Only five people RSVP'd yes. Well, that hasn't met our pivot trigger that we set of 10. So we should cancel, right, obviously. And what we think is we feel Rotten, because nobody wants to come to our party. Nobody likes us. That's a bad place to be. We often see this with little experiments. Nobody clicked on the link. They hate us. They hate our company. They hate our team. They hate our design work. Oh, it's woe is us. What we're looking at here is actually three layers. We've got signals, stories, and options. 
I always use these colours, I don't know why, but that's just my convention. With signals, we're looking at what is actually happening in the world, outside of our judgement, what's really going on? Five people RSVP'd yes out of 50, that is a fact. What's the story we're telling? What's the interpretation that we've jumped to? Nobody wants to come to our party. That's not quite true, but often our stories are a bit of a wild over-interpretation of the data that we're seeing. Sound familiar? Uh, and then the options that we've got, at the moment we're locked on one option. And it's not an option we really like, and we don't really want to do it, uh, but we're thinking, well, we're going to have to do that, and we're just going to feel rubbish, and we're going to have a miserable party. No, I say instead, tell some more stories. Force yourself to say, well, what else could be going on? If we look at those signals in the world, what else might it be? And you know what? Maybe the date doesn't work. Maybe the date's not good. And actually, once you tell that other story, it enables you to start seeing other signals in the world. And we realise, oh, yeah, eight people said they were already going to Bob's that night. Oh, and six people said they were busy as well, yes. Oh, and Maddie says she's washing her hair. So maybe that's the date doesn't work, in which case we could change the date. That's another option. Fantastic. What's another story? Maybe it's because we made it a dress up as a pudding theme. Would anyone not like that? Oh yeah, our friends hate dressing up. Well, this gives us some more options. We could change the theme or we could change the friends. We can invite people who like dressing up. <laughs> so what we're doing here is exploring more of the space. And by telling more stories, it not only enables us to see more options for what we could do, but enables us to see more signals in the world. And we're, we're, we're freed up. Um, I like this as a quote actually from Gary Klein, which I should um, reference. But an insight is an unexpected shift to a new story about what's happening in the world. And that new story enables us to see more options in the world. So we're creating more options for how to adapt. We're not giving them to our team in this case, to, to our family. We're encouraging our family to come together and tell more stories about what's going on in order that our family think of more ideas. It's their ideas, it's not ours. We're facilitating the process. It makes them much more likely to, to jump on those ideas. When to use this? Any time is stuck debating about one idea, that's the killer, or two ideas, that's even worse. Should it be Dave's idea or Susie's idea? Let's A-B test it. No! Instead, jump into this, tell more stories, see more signals, create more options. There are always more than one or two options. This is also useful when we're stuck with no idea at all. What do we do? We can start telling more stories, the options will emerge. How do you do this? You just do it. You don't even need to ask permission. What I will do is I, I detect that this is happening and I just start putting stickies on a Miro board or on, a, on writing them down on a piece of paper and we just get on with it. So these three methods are very much like the methods that, that Kate was talking about. They're really small, very quick to do, relatively safe to do, and they can make a big difference or they might not. If they don't, that's fine. You can adapt. That's what we're going to do. So there's a one bonus thing that I was wrong about, which early on I thought, well, and I see many teams still thinking this, we need to align on the vision before we can start. How do we know what to do if we haven't got the vision? The problem when you're innovating is you, you don't know where you're going. You, no one's done it before because it's innovation, or at least no one on your team has done it before, even if other people in the world have done something similar. You don't know what the vision should be. And the the commonality between all the projects that I saw that failed were they stuck to the vision they thought they should be doing on day one. And all the projects that succeeded, well, where we ended up at the end was nothing like what we thought we were going to do at the beginning. It was nothing like anyone could have thought we were going to do at the beginning. It was what we learned along the way that guided us to find something new. And so what I realised was, no, alignment doesn't come before success. Alignment comes after success. It's when we're looking back and telling the story of how we won that we, we align on what really happened. And it's just a story. It's just a story we're telling about why we were so awesome and why we were so successful. Or a story, alignment also comes after failure, of course, a story about how it wasn't really our fault and it was the market. And we, if only we'd known at the beginning. So, overall... Sure, make a plan, but try not to over plan. You want to make a plan and agree when you're going to tear it up. And you can use a time machine to see, uh, I think I've got them there, yeah. Here they are as cards. 
just building up to the thing. You can use a time machine to help you all agree where are the most important places to change, to, to be able to adapt. Your pivot triggers to set, right, well, when we do our probes and check if, if we're right to be afraid of those things, when are we going to adapt? And then an afternoon insight to figure out how should we adapt when we get there. That's exactly 25 minutes, which I'm quite pleased about. Uh, those are just three out of 54 cards in the Innovation Tactics deck. There is the ability to get 10% off and give me a little kickback if you use the link at the bottom of the screen there. I love all these methods. They're all a bit like these ones I've just shared. Little things that you can use right now in order to shift how things work um, and, and do things better and innovate. But there's a little surprise as well. We've got a little giveaway, and I've got a few people's names who have managed to win one of five decks that I have here. So I'm going to shout those out and hope that they're here. Uh, and if you want more innovation, if you want more information about these techniques and other stuff, then please do follow me. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to call out for Anne Hutchings from the British Council. Do, uh, if you, if you, if you. If, blah, blah, blah. if your name is called, please do just run up to the stage and collect one of these. I'm going to grab them now. Uh, so that's Anne Hutchings from the British Council, Julia Putnina from CX Partners, Amy Blackwell from JP Morgan. <laughs> Yay, JP Morgan! Uh, Nicole Tansella from Flagstone. <laughs> Big crew in from Flagstone. And Dominic Warren from Mercator Digital. Let's hope we have everyone. Good, congratulations. <laughs> cool, and you'd be Dominic. Cool. Is this the final recipient? Marvellous. Cheers. Okay, so that is it from me. Thank you ever so much.